Chapter 2 of the Book of Buried Treasure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Buried Treasure by Ralph Delahaye Payne. Chapter 2 Captain Kidd in Fact and Fiction. Doomed to an infamy undeserved, his name reddened with crimes he never committed and made wildly romantic by tales of treasure which he did not bury captain william kidd is fairly entitled to the sympathy of posterity and the apologies of all the ballad makers and alleged historians who have obscured the facts in a cloud of fable for two centuries this grisly phantom has stalked through the legends and literature the black flag as the king of pirates and the most industrious depositor of ill-gotten gold and jewels that ever wielded pick and shovel his reputation is simply prodigious his name has frightened children wherever english is spoken and the kid tradition or myth is still potent to send treasure seekers exploring and excavating almost every beach cove and headland between nova scotia and the gulf of mexico fate has played the strangest tricks imaginable with the memory of this seventeenth century seafarer who never cut a throat or made a victim walk the plank who was no more than a third or fourth rate pirate in an era when this interesting profession was in its heyday and who was hanged at execution dock for the excessively unromantic crime of cracking the skull of his gunner with a wooden bucket as for the riches of captain kidd the original documents in his case preserved among the state papers of the public record office in london relate with much detail what booty he had and what he did with it alas they reveal the futility of the searches after the stout sea chest buried above high water mark the only authentic kid treasure was dug up and inventoried more than two hundred years ago, nor has the slightest clue to any other been found since then. These curious documents, faded and sometimes tattered, invite the reader to thresh out his own conclusions as to how great a scoundrel kid really was, and how far he was a scapegoat who had to be hanged to clear the fair names of those noble lords in high places who were partners and promoters of that most unlucky sea venture in which kid sent out to catch pirates was said to have turned amateur pirate himself rather than sail home empty-handed certain it is that these words of the immortal ballad are cruelly grotesquely unjust i made a solemn vow when i sailed when i sailed i made a solemn vow when i sailed i made a solemn vow to god i would not bow nor myself a prayer allow as i sailed i had a bible in my hand when i sailed when i sailed I'd a Bible in my hand when I sailed. I'd a Bible in my hand by my father's great command, and I sunk it in the sand when I sailed. In English fiction, there are three treasure stories of surpassing merit for ingenious contrivance and convincing illusion. These are Stevenson's Treasure Island, Poe's Goldbug, and Washington Irving's Wolfert Weber. Differing widely in plot and literary treatment, each peculiar to the genius of its author, they are blood kin, sprung from a common ancestor, namely, the Kid legend. Why, this half-hearted pirate, who was neither red-handed nor of heroic dimensions, even in his badness, should have inspired more romantic fiction than any other character in American history, is past all explaining. Strangely enough, no more than a generation or two after Kid's sorry remnants were swinging in chains for the birds of Big Hat, they began to cluster around his memory, the folklore and superstitions colored by the supernatural which had been long current in many lands in respect of buried treasure it was a kind of diabolism which still survives in many a corner of the atlantic coast where tales of kid are told irving took these legends as he heard them from the long-winded ancients of his own acquaintance and wove them into delightfully entertaining fiction with the proper seasoning of the ghostly and the uncanny this formidable hero is an old pirate with a sea chest before time one of the kids rogues who appears at the Dutch tavern near Corlier's Hook, and there awaits tidings of his shipmates and the hidden treasure. It is well known that Stevenson employed a strikingly similar character in setting to get Treasure Island underway in the opening chapter. As a literary coincidence, the comparison of these pieces of fiction is of curious interest. The similarity is to be explained on the ground that both authors made use of the same material, whose groundwork was the kid legend in its various forms, as it has been commonly circulated stevenson confessed in his preface it is my debt to washington irving that exercises my conscience and justly so 
for I believe plagiarism was rarely carried farther. I chanced to pick up the Tales of a Traveler some years ago with a view to an anthology of prose narrative, and the book flew up and struck me. Billy Bones, his chest, company in the parlor, the whole inner spirit, and a good deal of the material detail of my first chapters, all were there, all were the property of Washington Irving. But I had no guess of it then, as I sat writing by the fireside, what seemed like the spring tides of a somewhat pedestrian fancy. Nor yet day by day, after lunch, as I read aloud my morning's work to the family, it seemed to me original as sin. It seemed to belong to me like my right eye. After the opening scenes, the two stories veer off on diverging tracks, the plot of Stevenson moving briskly along to the treasure voyage, with no inclusion of the supernatural features of the kid tradition. Irving, however, narrates at a leisurely pace all the gossip and legend that were rife concerning Kidd in the Manhattan of the worthy Knickerbockers, and he could stock a treasure chest as cleverly as Stevenson. But when Wolfert Weber dreamed that he had discovered an immense treasure in the center of his garden, at every stroke of the spade he laid bare a golden ingot diamond crosses sparkled out of the dust bags of money turned up their bellies corpulent with pieces of eight or venerable doubloons and chests wedged clothes with moidores ducats and pistorines yawned before his ravished eyes and vomited forth their glittering contents the warp and woof of warford weber is the still persistent legend that Kidd buried treasure near the highlands of the lower Hudson, but that his ship, the Queda Merchant, was fetched from San Domingo by his men after he left her, and they sailed her into the Hudson, and there scuttled the vessel, scattering ashore and dividing a vast amount of plunder, some of which was hidden nearby. And years ago a pamphlet was published, purporting to be true, which was entitled An Account of Some of the Traditions and Experiments Respecting Captain Kidd's Piratical Vessel. In this it was soberly asserted that Kidd and the Quita merchant was chased into the North River by an English man-of-war, and finding himself cornered, he and his crew took to the boats with what treasure they could carry after setting fire to the ship, and fled up the Hudson, thence footing it through the wilderness to Boston. The sunken ship was searched for from time to time, and the explorers were no doubt assisted by another pamphlet published early in the 19th century, which proclaimed itself as a wonderful mesmeric revelation giving an account of the discovery and description of a sunken vessel near caldwell's landing supposed to be that of the pirate kid including an account of his character and death at a distance of nearly three hundred miles from the place this psychic information came from a woman by the name of chester living in lynn massachusetts who swore she had never heard of the sunken treasure ship until while in a trance she beheld its shattered timbers covered with sand and bars of massive gold heaps of silver coin and precious jewels including many large and brilliant diamonds the jewels had been enclosed in shot bags of stout canvas there were also gold watches like duck eggs in a pond of water and the wonderfully preserved remains of a very beautiful woman with a necklace of diamonds around her neck as irving takes pains to indicate the basis of the legend of the sunken pirate ship came not from kidd but from another freebooter who flourished at the same time says peachy prawn during the whole converse with the old buccaneer in the tavern kidd never did bury money up the hudson nor indeed in any of those parts but many affirmed such to be the fact it was bradish and others of the buccaneers who had buried money some said in turtle bay others on long island others in the neighborhood of hellgate this bradish was caught by governor bellamont and sent to england where he was hanged at execution dock he had begun his career of crime afloat as a boatswain of a ship called the adventure not kidd's vessel while on the voyage from london to borneo he helped other mutineers to take the vessel from a skipper and go a cruising as gentlemen of fortune they split up forty thousand dollars of specie found on board snapped up a few merchantmen to fatten their dividends and at length came to the american coast and touched at long island the adventure ship was abandoned and there was reason to think she was taken possession of by the crew of the purchased sloop who worked her around to new york and beached and sunk her after stripping her of fittings and gear Radish and his crew also cruised along the Sound for some time in their small craft, landing and buying supplies at several places, until nineteen of them were caught and taken to Boston. That there should have been some confusion of facts relating to Kidd and Radish is not at all improbable. Among the Dutch of New Amsterdam was to be found that worldwide superstition of the ghostly guardians of buried treasure, and Irving interpolates the distressful experience of Cobus Quackabos, who dug for a whole night and met with incredible difficulty for as fast as he threw one shovelful of earth out of the hole two were thrown in by invisible hands 
He succeeded so far, however, as to uncover an iron chest, and there was a terrible roaring, ramping, and raging of uncouth figures about the hole, and at length a shower of blows, dealt by invisible cudgels, fairly belabored him off of the forbidden ground. This Cobus Quagambos had declared on his deathbed, so that there could not be any doubt of it. He was a man that had devoted many years of his life to money digging, and it was thought would have ultimately succeeded had he not died recently of a brain fever in the almshouse. A story built around the kid tradition, but of a wholly different kind, is that masterpiece of curious deductive analysis, the gold bug, with its cryptogram and elaborate mystification. In making use of a historical character to serve the ends of fiction, it is customary to make him move along the episodes of the story with some regard for the probabilities. For example, it would hardly do to have Napoleon win the Battle of Waterloo as the hero of a novel. What really happened, what the author imagines might have happened, must be dovetailed with an eye to avoid contradicting the known facts. Like almost everyone else, however, Ho took the most reckless liberties with the career of poor Captain Kidd and his buried treasure, and cared not a rap for historical evidence to the contrary. Although Stevenson is ready to admit that his skeleton is conveyed from Poe, the author of Treasure Island, it is not wholly fair to himself. The tradition that secretive pirates were wont to knock a shipmate or two on the head as a feature of the program of burying treasure is as old as the hills. The purpose was either to get rid of the witness who had helped dig the hole, or to cause the spot to be properly haunted by ghosts as an additional precaution against the discovery of the hoard. What Stevenson conveyed from Poe was the employment of a skeleton to indicate the bearings and location of the treasure, although, to be accurate, it was a skull that figured in the gold bug. Otherwise, in the discovery of the remains of slain pirates, both were using a stock incident of buried treasure lore, most generally fastened upon the unfortunate Captain Kidd. Most of the treasure legends of the Atlantic coast are fabled in moonshine with no more foundation than what somebody heard from his grandfather who may have dreamed that Captain Kidd or Blackbeard once landed in a nearby cove. The treasure seeker needs no evidence, however, and with him, faith is the substance of things hoped for. There is a marsh of the Penobscot River, a few miles inland from the bay of that name, which has been indefatigably explored for more than a century. A native of statistical turn of mind not long ago expressed himself in this common-sense manner. Thousands of tons of soil have been shoveled over time and again. I figure that these treasure hunters have handled enough earth in turning up codlid marsh to build embankments and fill cuts for a railroad grade twenty miles long. In other words, if these lunatics that have tried to find kids' money had hired out with the railroad contractors, they could have earned $30,000 at regular day's wages instead of the few battered old coins discovered in 1798 which started all this terrible waste of energy. The most convincing evidence of the existence of a pirate's rendezvous and hoard has been found on Oak Island, Nova Scotia. In fact, this is the true treasure story, par excellence, of the whole Atlantic coast, with sufficient mystery to give it precisely the proper flavor. Local tradition has long credited Captain Kidd with having been responsible for the indubitable remains of piratical activity, but it has been proved the Kidd went nowhere near Nova Scotia after he came sailing home from the East Indies, and the industrious visitors to Oak Island are therefore unknown to history. The island has a sheltered haven called Mahone Bay, snugly secluded from the Atlantic with deep water, and a century ago the region was wild and unsettled. Near the head of the bay is a small cove which was visited in the year of 1795 by three young men named Smith, McGinnis, and Vaughan, who drew the canoes ashore and explored at random the noble groves of oaks. Soon they came to a spot whose peculiar appearance aroused their curiosity. The ground had been cleared many years before. This was indicated by the second growth of trees and the kind of vegetation which is foreign to the primeval condition of the soil. In the center of the little clearing was a huge oak whose bark was gashed with markings made by an axe. One of the stout lower branches had been sawn off at some distance from the trunk, and to this natural derrick arm had been attached a heavy block and tackle as shown by the furrowed scar in the bark. Directly beneath this was a perceptible circular depression of the turf, perhaps a dozen feet in diameter. The three young men were curious and made further investigation. The tide chanced to be uncommonly low, and while ranging along the beach of the cove, they discovered a huge iron ring bolt fastened to a rock which was invisible at ordinary low water. They reasonably surmised that this had been a mooring place in days gone by. Not far distant, a boatswain's whistle of an ancient pattern and copper coin bearing a date of 1713 were picked up. The trio scented pirate's treasure and shortly returned to the cove to dig in the clearing hard by the great oak. 
we soon found that they were excavating in a clearly defined shaft the walls of which were of the solid undisturbed earth in which the cleavage of other picks and shovels could be distinguished the soil within the shaft was much looser and easily removed ten feet below the surface they came to a covering of heavy oak plank which was ripped out with much difficulty at a depth of twenty feet another layer of planking was uncovered and digging ten feet deeper a third horizontal bulkhead of timber was laid bare the excavation was now thirty feet down and the three men had done all they could without a larger force hoisting machinery and other equipment the natives of mahone bay however were singularly reluctant to aid the enterprise hair-raising stories were afloat of ghostly guardians of strange cries of unearthly fires that flickered along the cove and all that sort of thing superstition effectually fortified the place and those bold spirits smith mcginnis and vaughan were forced to abandon their task for lack of reinforcements half a dozen years later a young physician of truro dr lins visited oak island having got wind of the treasure story and talked with the three men aforesaid he took their report seriously made an investigation of his own and straightway organized the company backed by considerable capital prominent persons of truro in the neighborhood were among the investors including colonel robert archibald captain david archibald and sheriff harris a gang of laborers was mustered at the cove and the dirt began to fly the shaft was open to a depth of ninety-five feet and as before some kind of covering or significant traces thereof was disclosed every ten feet or so one layer was of charcoal spread over a matting of a substance resembling cocoa fiber while another was of putty some of which was used in glazing the windows of a house and building on the nearby coast ninety feet below the surface the laborers found a large flat stone or quarried slab three feet long and sixteen inches wide upon which was chiseled the traces of an inscription this stone was used in the jam of a fireplace of a new house belonging to smith and was later taken to halifax in the hope of having the mysterious inscription deciphered one wise man declared that the letters read ten feet below two million pounds lie buried but this verdict was mostly guesswork the stone is still in halifax where it was used for beating leather into a bookbinder's shop until the inscription had been worn away when the workmen were down ninety-five feet they came to a wooden platform covering the shaft until then the hole had been clear of water but overnight it filled within twenty-five feet of the top persistent efforts were made to bail out the flood but with such poor success that the shaft was abandoned in another sunk nearby the plan being to tunnel into the first pit and thereby drain it and get at the treasure the second shaft was driven to a depth of a hundred and ten feet while the tunnel was in progress the water broke through and made the laborers flee for their lives the company had spent all its money and the results were so discouraging that the work was abandoned it was not until eighteen forty nine that another attempt was made to fathom the meaning of the extraordinary mystery of oak island dr lins and vaughan were still alive and their narratives inspired the organization of another treasure-seeking company vaughan easily found the old money pit as it was called and the original shaft was opened and cleared to a depth of eighty-six feet when an inrush of water stopped the undertaking again the work ceased for lack of adequate pumping machinery and it was decided to use a boring apparatus such as was employed in prospecting for coal a platform was rigged in the old shaft and the large auger bit its way in a manner described by the manager of the enterprise as follows the platform was struck at ninety-eight feet just as the old diggers found it after going through this platform which was five inches thick and proved to be of spruce the auger dropped twelve inches and then went through four inches of oak then it went through twenty-two inches of metal in pieces the auger failed to take any of it except three links resembling an ancient watch chain it then went through eight inches of oak which was thought to be the bottom the first box the top of the next then through twenty-two inches of metal the same as before and four inches of oak and six inches of spruce then into clay seven feet without striking anything in the next boring the platform was struck as before at ninety-eight feet passing through this the auger fell about eighteen inches and came in contact with as supposed the side of a cask the flat chisel revolving close to the side of the cask gave it a jerk and an irregular motion on withdrawing the auger several splinters of oak such as might come from the side of an oak stave and a small quantity of a brown fibrous substance resembling the husk of a coconut were brought up the distance between the upper and lower platforms was found to be six feet in the summer of eighteen fifty a third shaft was sunk just to the west of the money pit but this also filled with water which was discovered to be salt and affected by the rise and fall of the tide in the cove it was reasoned that if a natural inlet existed those who had buried the treasure must have encountered the inflow which would have made their undertaking impossible therefore the pirates must have driven some kind of tunnel or passage from the cove with the object of flooding out any subsequent intruders search was made along the beach 
and near where the ring bolt was fastened in the rock a bed of the brown fibrous material was uncovered and beneath it a mass of small rock unlike the surrounding sand and gravel it was decided to build a coffer dam around this place which appeared to be a concealed entrance to a tunnel connecting the cove with the money pit in removing the rock a series of well-constructed drains was found extending from a common center and fashioned of carefully laid stone before the coffer dam was finished it was overflowed by a very high tide and collapsed under pressure the explorers did not rebuild it but set to work sinking a shaft which was intended to cut into this tunnel and dam the inlet from the cove one failure however followed on the heels of another and shaft after shaft was dug only to be caved in or filled by salt water in one of these was found an oak plank several pieces of timber bearing the mark of tools and many hewn chips a powerful pumping engine was installed timber cribbing put in the bottom of the shafts and a vast amount of clay dumped on the beach in an effort to block up the end of the seawater tunnel baffled in spite of all this exertion the treasure seekers spent their money and had to quit empty-handed forty years passed and the crumbling earth almost filled the numerous and costly excavations and the grass grew green under the sentinel oaks then in eighteen ninety six the cove was once more astir with boats and the shore populous with toilers the old records had been overhauled and their evidence was so luring that fresh capital was subscribed and many shares eagerly snapped up in curro halifax and elsewhere the promoters became convinced that the former attempts had failed because of crude appliances and insufficient engineering skill and this time the treasure was sought in up-to-date fashion almost twenty deep shafts were dug one after the other in a ring about the money pit and tunnels driven in a network it was the purpose of the engineers to intercept the underground channel and also to drain the pirates excavation hundreds of pounds of dynamite were used and thousands of feet of heavy timber further traces of the work of the ancient contrivers of this elaborate hiding place were discovered but the funds of the company were exhausted before the secret of the money pit could be revealed considerable boring was done under the direction of the manager captain welling the results confirmed the previous disclosure achieved by the auger at a depth of one hundred and twenty-six feet captain welling's crew drilled through oak wood and struck a piece of iron past which they could not drive the encasing pipe a smaller auger was then used and that one hundred and fifty-three feet cement was found of a thickness of seven inches covering another layer of oak beyond was some soft metal and the drill brought to the surface a small fragment of sheepskin parchment upon which was written in ink the syllable v i or w i other curious samples wood and iron were fished up but the soft metal presumed to be gold or silver refused to cling to the auger it was of course taken for granted that the various layers of oak planking and spruce were chests containing the treasure during the various borings seven different chests or casks or whatever they may be have been encountered it seems incredible that any pirates or buccaneers known to the american coast should have been at such prodigious pains to conceal their plunder as to dig a hole a good deal more than a hundred feet deep connected with the sea by an underground passage and safeguarded by many layers of timber cement and other material possibly some of the famous freebooters of the spanish main in henry morgan's time might have achieved such a task but nova scotia was a coast unknown to them and thousands of miles from their track poor kid had neither the men the treasure nor the opportunity to make such a memorial of his career as this quite recently a new company was formed to grapple with the secret of oak island which has already swallowed at least a hundred thousand dollars in labor and machinery for more than a century sane hard-headed nova scotians have tried to reach the bottom of the money pit and in this attractive speculation it has no rival in the field of treasure seeking there may be documents somewhere in existence a chart or memorandum mouldering in a sea chest in some attic or cellar of france england or spain that will furnish the key to this rarely picturesque and tantalizing puzzle the unbeliever has only to go to nova scotia in the summer time and seek out oak island which is reached by way of the town of chester to find a deeply pitted area of the treasure hunt and very probably engines are working busy at the fine old game of digging for pirates gold let us now give the real captain kidd his due painting him no blacker than facts warrant and at the same time uncover the true story of his treasure which is the plum and the pudding he had been a merchant shipmaster of brave and honorable repute in an age when every deep water voyage was a hazard of privateers and freebooters of all flags or none at all in one stout square rigger after another well armed and heavily manned he had sailed out of the port of new york in which he dwelt as early as sixteen eighty nine he had a comfortable even prosperous home in liberty street was married to a widow of a good family and was highly thought of by the dutch and english merchants of the town a shrewd trader who made money for his owners he was also a fighting seaman of such proven mettle 
and he was given command of privateers which cruised along the coast of the colonies and harried the french in the west indies his excellent reputation and character are attested by official documents in the recordings of the proceedings of the provincial assembly of new york is the following entry under date of april eighteenth sixteen ninety one gabriel mondel esq and thomas willard esq are appointed to attend the house of representatives and acquaint them of the many good services done to this province by captain william kidd in his attending here with his vessels before his excellency's arrival and that it would be acceptable to his excellency and his board that they consider of some suitable reward to him for his good services this indicates captain kidd had been in command of a small squadron engaged in protecting the commerce of the colony on may fourteenth the following was adopted by the house of representatives ordered that his excellency be addressed unto to order the receiver general to pay captain william kidd one hundred and fifty pounds current money of this province as a suitable reward for the many good services done to this province in june only a month after this captain kidd was asked by the colony of massachusetts to punish the pirates who were pestering the shipping of boston and salem the negotiations were conducted in this wise by the governor and council proposals offered to captain kidd and captain walkington to encourage their going forth in their majesty's service to suppress an enemy privateer now upon this coast and to have liberty to beat up drums for forty men apiece to go forth on this present expedition not taking any children or servants without their parents or master's consent a list of the names of such as go in the said vessels to be presented to the governor before their departure that they cruise upon the coast for a space of ten or fifteen days in search of the said privateer then come in again and land the men spied them from hence and what provisions shall be expended within said time for so many men as are in both the said vessels be made good to them on a return in case they take no purchase but if they shall take the privateer or any other vessels and only proportion of the provisions for so many men as they take in here if any of our men have to be wounded in engagement with privateer that they be cured at the public charge that the men supplied from hence be proportionable sharers with the other men belonging to said vessels of all purchase that shall be taken besides the promise of a gratuity to the captains twenty pounds apiece in money boston june eighth sixteen ninety one to this thrifty set of terms captain kidd made reply in primus to have forty men with their arms provisions and ammunition secondly all the men that shall be wounded which have been put in by the country shall be put on shore in the country to take care of them and if so fortunate as to take the pirate enterprises then to bring them to boston thirdly for myself to have one hundred pounds in money thirty pounds thereof to be paid down the rest upon my return to boston and if we bring in said ship enterprises then the same to be divided amongst our men fourthly the provisions put on board must be ten barrels for pork and beef ten barrels for flour two hogs head of peas and one barrel of gunpowder for the great guns fifthly that i will cruise on the coast for ten days time and if so that he has gone off the coast that i cannot hear of him i will then at my return take care and set what men on shore that i have had and are willing to leave me or the ship these records serve to show in what esteem captain kidd was held by the highest officials of the colonies such men as he were sailing out of boston new york and salem to trade in uncharted seas on remote coasts and fight their way home again with rich cargoes they hammered out the beginnings of a mighty commerce for the new world and created by the stern stress of circumstances as fine a race of seamen as ever filled cabin and forecastle in the year sixteen ninety five captain kidd chanced to be anchored in london port in his brigantine antigoa busy with loading merchandise and shipping a crew for the return voyage across the atlantic now richard coote earl of belmont an ambitious and energetic irishman had just been then appointed royal governor of the colonies of new york and massachusetts and he was particularly bent on suppressing the swarm of pirates who infested the american coast and waxed rich on the english commerce of the indian ocean their booty was carried to rhode island new york and boston even from far away madagascar and many a colonial merchant outwardly the pattern of respectability was secretly trafficking in this plunder i send you my lord to new york said king william the third to bellamont as an honest and intrepid man has wanted to put these abuses down because i believe you to be such a man thereupon belmont asked for a frigate to send in chase of the bold sea rogues but the king referred him to the lords of the admiralty who discovered sundry obstacles bound in red tape the fact being that official england was at all times singularly indifferent or covertly hostile toward the maritime commerce of her american colonies being denied a man-of-war 
Beaumont conceived the plan of privately equipping an armed ship as a syndicate enterprise, without cost to the government. The promoters were to divide the swag captured from pirates as dividends on their investment. The enterprise was an alluring one, and 6,000 pounds sterling were subscribed by Belmont and his friends, including such illustrious personages as Summers, the Lord Chancellor and leader of the Whig Party, the Earl of Shrewsbury, the Earl of Orford, First Lord of the Admiralty, the Earl of Romney, and Sir Richard Harrison, a wealthy merchant. According to Bishop Burnet, it was the king who proposed managing by a private enterprise and said he would lay down 3,000 pounds himself and recommended it to his ministers to find out the refit. In compliance with this, the Lord Summers, the Earl of Arford, Romney, Belmont, and others contributed the whole expense, for the king excused himself by reason of other accidents and did not advance the sum he had promised. Macaulay, discussing in his History of England the famous scandal which later involved these partners of Kidd, defends them in this spirited fashion. The loss that could be imputed even to Bellamont, who had drawn in all the rest, was that he had been led into a fault by his ardent zeal for the public service, and by the generosity of a nature as little prone to suspect as to devise villainies. His friends in England might surely be pardoned for giving credit to his recommendations. It is highly probable that the motive which induced some of them to aid his designs was a genuine public spirit. But if we suppose them to have had a view to gain, it would be a legitimate gain. Their conduct was the very opposite of corrupt. Not only had they taken no money, they had dispersed money largely, and had dispersed it with the certainty that it should never be reimbursed unless the outlay proved beneficial to the public. It would be easy to pick flaws in this argument. Belmont's partners, no matter how public-spirited, hoped to reimburse themselves, and something over as receivers of stolen goods. It was a dashing speculation, characteristic of its century, and neither better nor worse than the privateering of that time. What raised the subsequent row in Parliament, and made of Kidd a political issue and party scapegoat, was the fact that his commission was given under the great seal of England, thus stamping a private business with the public sanction of His Majesty's government. For this summers, his Lord Chancellor was responsible, and it later became a difficult transaction for his partisans to defend. It was in London at that time when Robert Lewingston, founder of a family long notable in the colony and state of New York, a man of large property and solid station. He was asked to recommend a shipmaster fitted for the task in hand, and named Captain Kidd, who was reluctant to accept. His circumstances were prosperous. He had a home and family in New York, and he was by no means anxious to go roving after pirates, who were pretty certain to fight for their necks. His consent was won by the promise of a share of the profits. Kidd was a canny Scot by birth, and by an offer of Livingston to be his security and partner in the venture. An elaborate contract was drawn up with the title of Articles of Agreement, made this 10th day of October, in the year of our Lord, 1695, between the Right Honorable Richard, Earl of Bellamont, on the one part, and Robert Livingston, Esquire, and Captain William Kidd, on the other part. In the first article, the said Earl of Bellamont doth then agree at his proper charge to procure from the King's Majesty, or from the Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty, as the case may require, one or more commissions, empowering him, said Captain Kidd, to act against the King's enemies, and to take prizes from them as a private man of war, in the usual manner, and also to fight with, conquer and subdue pirates, and to take them and their goods with such large and beneficial powers and clauses in such commissions as may be most proper and effectual in such cases. Bellamont agreed to pay four-fifths of the cost of the ship with its furnishings and provisions, Kidd and Livingston to contribute the remainder, in pursuance of which Bellamont was to pay down sixteen hundred pounds on or before 6th of November in order to have a speedy buying of said ship. The Earl agreed to pay such further sums as should complete and make up said four parts of five of the charge of said ship's apparel, furniture, and victualling within seven weeks after the date of the agreement, and Kidd and Livingston bound themselves to do likewise in respect to their fifth part of the expense. Other articles of the agreement read, 7. The said Captain Kidd doth covenant and agree to procure and take with him on board of the said ship one hundred mariners, or seamen, or thereabout, and to make what reasonable and convenient speed he can to set out to sea with said ship, and to sail to such parts and places where he may meet with said pirates, and to use his utmost endeavor to meet with, subdue, and conquer the said pirates, and take from them their goods, merchandise, and treasures, also to take what prizes he can from the king's enemies, and forthwith to make the best of his way to Boston and New England, and that without touching at any other port or harbor whatsoever, or without breaking bulk, 
or diminishing any part of what he shall take or obtain, of which he shall make oath in case the same is desired by the said Earl Belmont, and there to deliver the same into the hands or possession of the said Earl. He, the said Captain Kidd, doth agree that the contract and bargain which he will make with the said ship's crew shall be no purchase, no pay, and not otherwise, and that the share and proportion which his said crew shall, by such contract, have of such prizes, goods, merchandise, and treasure, as he shall take as prize, or from any pirates, shall not at the most exceed a fourth part of the same, and shall be less than a fourth part, in case the same may reasonably and conveniently be agreed upon. 9. Robert Livingston Esquire and Captain William Kidd agree that if they catch no pirates, they will refund to the said Earl Bellamont all the money advanced by him on or before March 25th, 1697, and they will keep the said ship. Article 10 allotted to capture goods and treasures after deducting no more than one-fourth for the crew. The remainder was to be divided into five equal parts, of which Bellamont was to receive four parts, leaving a fifth to be shared between Kidd and Livingston. The stake of Captain Kidd was therefore to be three one-fortieths of the whole, or seven and one-half percent of the booty. It is apparent from these singular articles of the agreement that Robert Livingston, in the role of Kidd's financial backer, was willing to run boldly speculative chances of success, and was also confident that a rich crop of pirates could be caught for the seeking. If Kidd should sail home empty-handed, then these two partners stood to lose a large amount, by virtue of the contract which provided that Bellamont and his partners must be reimbursed for their outlay, less the value of the ship itself. Livingston also gave bonds and the sum of ten thousand pounds that Kidd would be faithful to his trust and obedient to his orders, which in itself is sufficient to show that this shipmaster was a man of the best intention and of thoroughly proven worth. Captain Kidd's privateering commission was issued by the High Court of Admiralty on December 11, 1695, and licensed and authorized him to set forth in a warlike manner in the said ship called the Adventure Galley, under his own command, and therewith, with force of arms, to apprehend, seize, and take the ships, vessels, and goods belonging to the French king, his subjects, or inhabitants within the dominion of the said French king, and such other ships, vessels, and goods, as are, or shall be liable to confiscation, etc. This document was of the usual tenor, but in addition, Captain Kidd was granted a special royal commission, under the great seal, which is given herewith, because it so intimately concerned the later fortunes of his noble partners. William the Rex, William the Third, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, etc., to our trusty and well-beloved Captain William Kidd, commander of the ship Adventure Galley, or to any other the commander of the same, for the time being, greeting. Whereas, we are informed that Captain Thomas II, John Ireland, Captain Thomas Wake, Captain William Mays, and other subjects, natives or inhabitants of New York and elsewhere in our plantations in America, have associated themselves with diverse other wicked and ill-disposed persons, and do against the law of nations commit many and great piracies, robberies, and depredations on the seas upon the parts of America and in other parts, to the great hindrance and discouragement of trade and navigation, and to the great danger and hurt of our loving subjects, our allies, and of all others navigating the seas upon their lawful occasions. Now know ye that we being desirous to prevent the aforesaid mischief, and as much in this lies, to bring the said pirates, rebooters, and sea rovers to justice, have thought fit, and do hereby give and grant to the said Robert Kidd, to whom our commissioners for exercising the office of Lord High Admiral of England have granted a commission as a private man of war bearing date of the eleventh day of December, 1695, and unto the commander of said ship for the time being, and unto the officers, mariners, and others which shall be under your command, full power and authority to apprehend, seize and take into your custody as well as said captain two john ireland captain thomas wake captain william mace the mace and all such pirates freebooters and sea rovers being either our subjects or of other nations associated with them which you shall meet with upon the seas or coasts of america or upon any other seas or coast with all their ships and vessels and all such merchandises money goods and wares as shall be found on board or with them in case they shall willingly yield themselves up but if they will not yield without fighting, then you are by force to compel to yield. And we also require you to bring or cause to be brought such pirates, freebooters, or sea rovers as you shall seize to a legal trial, to the end that they may be proceeded against according to law in such cases. And we do hereby command all our officers, ministers, and others, our living subjects whatsoever, to be aiding and assisting you in the premises, 
and we do hereby enjoin you to keep an exact journal of your proceedings and execution of the premises, and set down the names of such pirates, and of their officers and company, and the names of such ships and vessels, as you shall by virtue of these presents take and seize, and the quantity of arms, ammunition, provisions, and lading of such ships, and the true value of the same, as near as you judge. And we do hereby strictly charge and command, and you will answer to the contrary to your peril, that you do not, in any manner, offend or molest our friends and allies, their ships or subjects, by color or pretense of these presents, or the authority thereof granted. In witness thereof, we have caused our great seal of England to be affixed to these presents, given at our court in Kensington, the 26th day of January, 1696, in the seventh year of our reign. It was privately understood that the king was to receive one-tenth of the proceeds of the voyage, although this stipulation does not appear in the Articles of Agreement. By a subsequent grant from the crown, this understanding was publicly ratified, and all money and property taken from the pirates, except the king's tenth, was to be made over to the owners of the adventure galley, to wit, Belmont and his partners, and Kidd and Livingston, as they had agreed among themselves. The adventure galley, the ship selected for the cruise, was of 287 tons and 34 guns, a powerful privateer for her day, which Kidd fitted out at Plymouth, England. Finding difficulty in recruiting a full crew of meddlesome lads, he sailed from that port for New York in April 1696 with only 70 hands. While anchored in the Hudson, he increased his company to 155 men, many of them the riffraff of the waterfront, deserters, wastrels, brawlers, and broken seamen who may have sailed under the black flag for a time. It was a desperate venture, and the pay was to be in shares of the booty taken. No prizes, no money and sober, respectable sailors looked askance at it. Kidd was impatient to make an offing. Livingston and Bellamont were chaffing at the delay, and he had to ship what men he could find at short notice. The adventure galley cruised first among the West Indies, honestly in quest of pirates, freebooters, and sea rovers. Not falling in with any of these gentry, Kidd took his departure for the Cape of Good Hope in the Indian Ocean. This was in accordance with his instructions, for in the preamble of the Articles of Agreement it was stated that certain persons did some time since depart from New England, Rhode Island, New York, and other parts in America and elsewhere, with an intention to pirate and to commit spiles and depredations in the Red Sea and elsewhere, and to return with such riches and goods as they should get to certain places by them agreed upon, which said persons and places, the said Captain Kidd, hath noticed. This long voyage was soundly planned. Madagascar was the most notorious haunt of pirates in the world. Their palm-thatched villages fringed its beaches, and the Blue Harbor sheltered many sail which sallied forth to play havoc with the precious argosies of the English, French, and Dutch East India companies. Kidd hoped to win both favor and fortune by ridding these populous trade routes of the perils that menaced every honest skipper. When at length Madagascar was sighted, the adventure galley was nine months from home. Not a prize had been taken. Kidd was short of provisions and of money with which to purchase supplies. His crew was in a grumbling, mutinous temper as they rammed their tarry fist into their empty pockets and stared into the empty hold. The captain quieted them with promises of dazzling spoil. The adventure galley vainly skirted the coast, only to find that some of the pirates got wind of her coming while others were gone a-cruising. From the crew of a wrecked French ship, Kidd took enough gold to buy provisions in a Malabar port. This deed was highly generous, but by virtue of his letters of mark, Kidd was authorized to despoil a Frenchman wherever he caught him. After more futile cruising to and fro, Kidd fell from grace and crossed the very tenuous line that divided privateering from piracy in his century. His first unlawful capture was a small native vessel owned by Aidan Merchants and commanded by one Parker, an Englishman, the mate being a Portuguese. The plunder was no more than a bale or two of pepper and coffee and a few gold pieces. It was petty larceny, committed to quiet a turbulent crew, and to pay operating expenses. Parker made loud outcry ashore, and a little while later, Kidd was overtaken by a vengeful Portuguese man-of-war off the port of Carwar. The two ships hammered each other with broadsides and boat chasers six hours on end, when Kidd went his way with several men wounded. Sundry other small craft were made to stand and deliver after this without harm to their crews, but no treasure was lifted until Kidd ventured to molest the shipping of the great Mongol. That fabled potentate of Asia, whose empire had been found by Genghis Khan and extended by Tamerlane, and whose gorgeous palaces were at Samarkand, had a mighty commerce between the Red Sea and China, and his rich freights also swelled the business of the English East India Company. His ships were often convoyed by the English and the Dutch. 
It was from two of these vessels that Kidd took his treasure and thus achieved the brief career which rove the halter around his neck. First of these ships of the great Mongol he looted and burned, and of the second, the Queen of Merchant, he transferred his flag at forsaking the leaky, unseaworthy adventure galley on the Madagascar coast. Out of this capture he took almost a half a million dollars worth of gold, jewels, plate, silks, and other precious merchandise, of which his crew ran away with by far the greatest share, leaving Kidd with about one hundred thousand dollars in booty. It was charged that while on this coast, Kidd amicably consorted with a very notorious pirate named Culliford, instead of blowing him out of the water as he properly deserved. This was the most damning feature of his indictment, and there is no doubt that he sold Culliford cannon and munitions and received him in his cabin. On the other hand, Kidd declared that he would have attacked the pirate, but he was overpowered by his mutinous crew, who caroused with Culliford's rogues, and were wholly out of hand. And Kidd's story is lent to color truth by the fact that ninety-five of his men deserted to join the Mocha Frigate of Culliford and sailed with him under the Jolly Roger. It is fair to assume that if William Kidd had been the successful pirate he is portrayed, his own rascals would have stayed with him in the Keita Merchant, which was a large and splendidly armed and equipped ship of between four and five hundred tons. Abandoned by two-thirds of his crew and unable to find trustworthy men to fill their places, Kidd was in sore straits and decided to sail for home, square accounts with Belmont, trusting to his powerful friends to keep him out of trouble. In the meantime, the great Mongol and the English East India Company had made vigorous complaint, and Kidd was proclaimed a pirate. The royal pardon was offered all pirates that should repent of their sins, barring Kidd, who was particularly accepted by name. Many a villain whose hands were red with the slaughter of ships' crews was thus officially forgiven, while Kidd, who had killed no man, barring that mutineer, the gunner, William Moore, was hunted in every sea with a price on his head. On April 1, 1699, after an absence of almost two years, Kidd arrived at Anguilla, his first port of call in the West Indies, and went ashore to buy provisions. There he learned, to his consternation, that he had been officially declared a pirate and stood in peril of his life. People refused to have any dealings with him, and he sailed to St. Thomas, and then stuck to Curacoa, where he was able to get supplies through the friendship of an English merchant of Antigua. Henry Bolton, by name, who was not hampered by scruples or fear of the authorities, under the date of February 3rd, the governor of Barbados had written to Mr. Vernon, secretary of the Lords of the Council of Trade and Plantations in London. I received yours of the 23rd of November in relation to the apprehending your notorious pirate kid. He has not been heard of in these seas of late, nor do I believe he will think it safe to venture himself here, where his villainies are so well known. But if he does, all the diligence and application to find him out and seize him shall be used on my part that can be, with the assistance of a heavy, crazy vessel, this called a cruiser, that is ordered to attend upon me. The first news of Kidd was received from the officials on the island of Nevis, who wrote Secretary Vernon on May 18, 1699, as follows. Your letter of 23rd November, last in relation to that notorious pirate, Captain Kidd, came safe to our hands. I have sent copies thereof to Lieutenant or Deputy Governor of each respective island under this government, since which we have this following account of the said Kidd. That he lately came from Malagasco, in a large Genovese vessel of about 400 tons, 30 guns mounted and 80 men, and in this way, from those parts, his men mutinied, and 30 of them lost their lives. That his vessel is very leaky that several of his men have deserted him, so that he has not above five and twenty or thirty hands on board. About twenty days since he landed at Aguilla, where he tarried about four hours, but being refused a corps, sailed thence for the island of St. Thomas, and anchored off the harbor three days, at which time he treated with them, also for relief, but the governor absolutely denying him, he bore away further to leeward, as tis believed, to Puerto Rico or Crab Island, upon which advice we forthwith ordered his majesty's ship, Queensborough, now attending this government, Captain Rupert Billingsley, commander, to make the best of his way after him. And in case he met with his men, vassal in effects, to bring them up hither. That no embezzlement may be made, but that they may be secured until we have given you advice thereof. And as his majesty's pleasure, relating thereof too, can be known, we shall, by the first conveyance, transmit ye, like account of him, to the governor of Jamaica, so that if he goes farther than leeward, due care may be taken to secure him there. As for those men who have deserted him, we have taken all possible care to apprehend them, especially if they come within the districts of this government, and hope on return of his majesty's frigate, we shall be able to give you a more ample account hereof. We are, with all due respect, right honorable, your most obedient humble servants. Kidd dodged all this hue and cry, and was mightily anxious to get in touch with Bellamont without loss of time. 
He bought at Caracoa through the accommodating Henry Bolden, a Yankee sloop called the San Antonio, and transferred his treasure and part of his crew to her. Quita Merchant was convoyed as far as Hispaniola, now San Domingo, and hid her in a small harbor with considerable cargo, in charge of a handful of his men under the direction of Bolton. Then wearily and of an uneasy mind, Captain Kidd steered his sloop for the American coast and first touched at the fishing hamlet of Luz at the mouth of Delaware Bay. All led to the contrary. He made no calls along the Carolinas of Virginia to bury treasure. The testimony of Kidd's crew and passengers cannot be demolished on this score, besides which he expected to come to terms with Bellamont and adjust his affairs within the law, so there was no sane reason for his stopping to hide his valuables. The first episode that smacks in the least buried treasure occurred while the sloop was anchored off Luz. There had come from the East Indies as a passenger one James Gillum, pirate by profession, and he wished no dealings with the authorities. He therefore sent ashore in Delaware Bay his sea chest, which we may presume contained his private store of stolen gold. Gillum and his chest bob up in letters of Bellamont, but for the present let this reference suffice, as covered by a statement of Edward Davis of London, Mariner, made during the proceedings against Kidd in Boston that in or about the month of november sixteen ninety seven the examinate came boatswain of the ship adelia tempest rogers commander bound on a trading voyage for india and in the month of july following arrived at the island of madagascar and after having been there about five weeks the ship sailed thence and left this examinate in the island and being desirous to get off entered himself on board the ship whereof captain kidd was commander to work for his passage and accordingly came with him and said ship to hispaniola and thence in the sloop antonio to this place and that upon their arrival at the hoor kills in delaware bay there was a chest belonging to one james gillen put ashore there and the gardener's island there was several chests and packages put out of captain kidd's sloop into a sloop belonging to new york he knows not the quantity nor anything sent on shore at the said island nor doth he know that anything was put on shore at any island or place in this country only two guns of weight apiece or thereabout at Black Island. Signed, His Mark, Edward E. D. Davis. In Delaware Bay, Kidd bought stores, and five of the people of Luz were thrown into jail by the Pennsylvania authorities for having traded with him. Thence he sailed for Long Island Sound, entered it from the eastward end, and made for New York, cautiously anchoring in Oyster Bay, nowadays sedulously avoided by malefactors of great wealth. It was his purpose to open negotiations with Bellamont at long range, holding his treasure as an inducement for a pardon. In Moister Bay, he sent a letter to a lawyer in New York, James Emmett, who had before then defended pirates, and also a message to his wife. Emmett was asked to serve as a go-between, and he hastened to join Kidd on the sloop, explaining that Bellamont was in Boston. Thereupon the Antonio weighed anchor and sailed westward as far as Narragansett Bay, where Emmett landed and went overland to find Bellamont. End of chapter 2